All right. Are we going to start from here? He's going to introduce us. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, and good evening. I'm Andy Hageman, Associate Professor of English and Director of the Center for Ethics and Public Engagement here at Luther, a center that we call The Keep, where our mission is to encourage students and all of us really to reflect on our ethical responsibilities and opportunities, to utilize our education in day-to-day -day life, and to take action to contribute to our communities. I want to thank you all for coming to Luther College today or for joining on the live stream for this exciting event entitled, And Action, James Cada and Suzanne Egley on the Arts, Social Trust, and the Common Good. We'll open with a land acknowledgment. The land on which Luther College stands has been home to the Iowa, Sac, Fox, and Dakota people and their ancestors. As part of the neutral ground created by the US government to control the movement, lives, and livelihood of native peoples, this land was home to the Winnebago Ho-Chunk during their forced displacement from Wisconsin. The dispossession of the Iowa, Sac, Fox, and Dakota, and the forced migration of the Winnebago Ho-Chunk people was motivated by the interests of settlers such as those who founded this town and this college. The Winnebago, during their residence here, addressed the land as grandmother. The tribe's orator, Wakan Dekora, believed his people were extended the blessing of this place by the Great Spirit, saying, quote, we did not make it, nor could we make it so pretty and fair a land, end quote. Please honor this history and the ongoing connection of the descendants of these early residents to this place. Please also honor and care for the land, water, and resources as these residents did like a loved and loving elder to whom we owe our life. For the Keeps events, we like to invent, invite a Luther student to introduce our distinguished guests, and tonight, Sam Scheffler will do those honors. Before I turn things over to Sam, I'm just gonna ask for a quick show of hands, how many of us here have seen the film, The Straight Story? No. All right, oh, many yeah. of us. How many of us here applied to be extras on the film or got to see parts of it being made. All right, we've got a few there. How many of us hosted the real life Alvin Strait and were played by Mr. Kata in the film? <laughs> <laughs> All right. As a lovely turn of events, Mr. Dennis Rear is in the audience tonight. Um, he hosted the real Alvin, yeah. He hosted The Real Alvin in Claremont years ago, got to see a piece of his life wonderfully portrayed on the big screen, and I hope he's excited to, to be here today. We welcome him too. So I'm going to hand it over now to Sam Scheffler. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. <laughs> My name is Samuel Scheffler. I'm a sophomore here at Luther and a theater and political science double major with a history minor. Uh, I grew up in Lakeville, Minnesota. And I just want to thank you for joining us tonight to celebrate uh, the Straight Story's 25th anniversary. And uh, just reiterate, hello to everybody who is in the film, especially Mr. Dennis Rear. <laughs> Tonight's topic is pertinent to Luther, as arts are vital to the lifeblood of this institution. This academic year alone, Luther's home to over 600 musicians, uh, and that's around 40% of our student body. Beyond music, we are home to plenty of art, theater, visual communications, and dance majors and non-majors that are involved in many productions every year. Um, so in this hectic time as a college student, not really knowing what to do with our lives, and I've been informed this doesn't really change as I get older. I'm looking forward to hearing from tonight's speakers on how Luther students' passion for the arts can lead us to a better, more common good. And I'm thrilled to introduce our guests for the evening, Mr. James Cada and Suzanne Egley, who, uh, whose contributions to the arts, just like Alvin Strait's time on a tractor, are extensive. <laughs> James Cada, who played Danny Reardon in The Straight Story, brings 24 films worth of experience, with some quick highlights being An Untamed Heart, North Country, and A Serious Man. Beyond the screen, Keita has made a name for himself across the Midwest theater scene, including the renowned Guthrie, Chanhassen, and Old Log Theaters in Minnesota. 
Currently, Cater resides in Minnesota and continues to contribute to contribute community through art as a director at the Minnetonka High School in Minnetonka, Minnesota. Suzanne Egley's professional career ranges over four decades from New York to the Twin Cities. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Beyond her plentiful acting career, such as, such as performing at the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, Egley is a professor of communication and leadership at St. Mary's University and an owner of Communication Navigation, LLC, which trains professionals, leaders, and executives more effectively to communicate and collaborate with their company members. Egley contributes to uh, the common good as a director at Minnetonka High School in Minnetonka, Minnesota. So we'll have an hour or so with Mr. Keda and Ms. Egley. First, Mr. Keda will talk a little bit about his experience at the Straight Story. Next, they'll talk in conversation about the role of arts in theater and society and education. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a 10 to 15 minute mm. audience Q&A. Uh, and to the people watching the event live stream, I just want to say, uh, hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> So, without further ado, please join me with a warm Luther College welcome to Mr. James Kata and Suzanne Egley. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. You know, last week, uh, Jim and I were visiting our daughter in Washington, D.C. for the Easter holiday, and we turned on the TV in our hotel room, and we happened to capture um, Hillary Clinton being interviewed about a new um, Broadway musical that she had been asked to help produce. It's called The Suffs, which is short for The Suffragettes. And she said, there's a line from this new musical that I think is going to become famous. And we heard it, we thought, oh my gosh, yes. It is, progress is always possible, but not guaranteed. And we thought, wow, progress is always possible, but not guaranteed. How wonderful that the theater and movies can teach us about history. They expand our imagination. They help us have emotions that maybe we were, wouldn't have in our regular life. They really help depict the human experience. If we, and it's not just the uh, you know theater and and. Uh, you know, films, but it's visual arts and all the performing arts that do that for us, that help bring the human experience to life and that we can reflect on that. So we are really proud that as difficult as it kind of was, <laughs> that we spent our careers being professional actors. And we are so grateful to be asked here tonight to kind of share what our experience has um, been like and in particular to talk about the straight story and what a wonderful example of how that movie really you get the feeling of that social trust and how that impacts the common good. So that's where we want to start is just by talking about like what was your first impression when you read the script for our straight story? Well my first impression was I got called in by my agent to go to the casting director in Minneapolis where they handed me one page, uh, and then they handed me a separate page because they wanted me to audition for two different parts. <laughs> so uh, they videotaped all that, and then a couple of weeks later, um, Jane Alderman, who was a casting director from Chicago, came to the Twin Cities, and so they retaped me for one particular part, which is the part that I eventually got. It took about a month before my agent called me to say, yeah. hey, you got it. And I was like, great. <laughs> and who's directing? And they said, David Lynch. My experience with David Lynch <laughs> was watching Eraserhead, Blue Velvet, and Elephant Man. And Elephant Man was probably the straightest of those three. <laughs> the other two was like, I was wondering like, what is this guy going to be like? What yeah. is this thing about? Yeah. And then they. I mean, we have kids. Yeah, and then. <laughs> Wanted to be. Then they, they told me, <laughs> oh, it's a story about a guy who drove a, a lawnmower tractor across the state of Iowa, 280 miles or whatever it was. And I was like, really? Well, I guess that sounds like a David Lynch film, but <laughs> I have no idea what this guy is going to be like. Mm -hmm. uh, when I finally got down here to shoot, 
they had already shot everything in Claremont. So I, I didn't participate in any of that. Mm -hmm. uh, I did spend some time with Sissy Spacek because she, she was around pretty much for the entire shoot. Mm -hmm. um, everything that I filmed was at Dennis's house and their yard <laughs> and on the highway. Uh, so when I left, everything that was shot after those scenes, I had nothing to do with. Mm -hmm. uh, David Lynch turned out to be one of the finest directors I got. A, uh, I was really lucky to, to work with him. The thing that, that really struck me was he trusted actors to do their job. He knew exactly what he wanted out of every scene, and he knew how to explain it to an actor to get it there. So all he had to do was, uh, the, the first time that I actually met him, I was sitting talking to Richard Farnsworth and we'd been there probably at least an hour while they were setting cameras up and setting whatever else mm -hmm. before we even saw him. And then, you know, we got to talking about everything except the movie. He was telling me about, he, he lived in New Mexico. He pretty much was a cowboy mm -hmm. and he, he owned some cattle he had sold some cattle in Kansas City, and he was kind of ticked off because he didn't, he didn't like the price that he got for him. So that's basically what we were talking about. When David Lynch approached us, got down on one knee, and pretty much whispered, he said, okay, this is what I'm looking for in this scene. And we listened, and he said, okay, you guys ready? And he and I looked at each other and went, yes, sir. And we were done in like two or three takes, which is very unusual because I've been on movies where you do the same shot over and over all day long, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which so, generally means that the director is not, doesn't know what he wants. Yeah, yeah. When the, um, we just rewatched the movie on Saturday night, and I know some of you screened it last week, and I was reminded of when I first saw it. I remember thinking, oh, it, it feels like it's going so slow. <laughs> and wasn't that a reminder? And it took a while for my body to kind of like relax and go like, well, this was, it's okay. I can just relax and watch the movie. And it made me think about, first of all, all the movies we see now and how the edits are so close together. They're like this and his edits are um, really far apart. And how fast our lives are now, even compared to when this movie was shot 25 years ago. But that feeling of that film, which was even pretty slow for um, when that was in 1999. Mm -hmm. So that culture that he creates on the set is what allows, and, and also the star, like you're talking yeah. about Richard Farnsworth being there, but the, um, the relationships that were in there, like when you said the um, that first scene that you see Jim in is is uh, your you you and your wife and your neighbors, right? What were their names again in real life? Your neighbor that Janice and Johnny. Janice and Johnny. So they were played by friends of ours, Barbara and Jim Hahn, Barbara Kingsley and Jim Hahn, and then your wife was um, Sally, Sally Winger, Winger, who's who's a friend of mine who I've worked with a bunch of times. I've, first time I met her was I directed her in a couple of shows in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So I had known her for quite a while. Yeah. And I, I saw the movie and I'm like, they really seemed like a married couple. They were so comfortable with each other. And I'm like watching that. I remember like, well, oh yeah, he's married to me. <laughs> but, but they felt there was something about, and you don't see that. Jim's been in some movies where I've watched him. I go like, oh, now I can tell he doesn't like that actress or whatever. <laughs> Remember that one? I was like, hi, you didn't even, like, he goes, I don't like. So the, the culture is created by the, mainly by the director and the stars, the yeah. big stars. Right. So that was one of the ones where I could really feel something about that movie that was so important not just in the story that they told us, but what was happening for the um, artists that were all working on the film. Were the, um, so to talk about the, um, the burning of the, like the shoot where you had to burn the building down and everything. Oh, that, that was my actual first experience with, with David Lynch before he got oh, down yeah, on one knee. Oh yeah, that's so funny. Because we were nervous about so, the guy. He's like, he's kind of odd. You well, watch that, and I thought that's porn. That one movie, I was like, I don't 
think you, I think you better read the whole script because you hardly ever get the whole script. You don't get the script often. You just get your sides, your scenes. Right. So you're not really, and your agent can only do so much. Like, what's this going to be rated? I don't want to be in something that I would be in, don't want to be in, you know. And they assured us. I actually yesterday found my straight story script. <laughs> and this is the fifth revision of the third draft of this yeah. script. Yeah. Uh, what was the question? Oh, I forget. We were talking about the movie, about how he was a little nervous. Sometimes on sets, it can be very, um, not the kind of atmosphere you want to be around. You can talk about that later on some of the other films you worked out, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. But this one, you were a little nervous. What's this guy going to be like? And the first thing that you saw him was directing the, the, the yeah, fire. Yeah, I don't know if you remember the so, shot. It's where my film wife and the other couple were seated watching the burning of the barn where the fire department was practicing. Well, he had set up cameras behind us and for some reason, the shoot was not going particularly well. I don't know what it was that he was looking for, but we did it over and over and over again. Lighting and sound and all and that all stuff. And all of a sudden, I, I heard him kick the dirt and he went, doggone it! <laughs> and I thought, this is the guy that made blue velvet? <laughs> he doesn't and, swear. And all we got out of him was a dog on it? <laughs> yeah. the, I mean, he never swore. At, he was like the gentlest, director I've ever worked for. Yeah. So tell, I mean, I assume they want to hear a little bit about some of your other movies that you've been on. The Stinkers? This is kind of fun <laughs> because, I mean, you've been in some wonderful films. Some yeah, really I've been good some films. great Iron films. Iron Will, if you haven't seen Iron Will, that's a great movie. Um, and we tend to like, when you think about, when we talk about the common good, we talk about social trust, that the movies that we are, are proud of, the shows that we are proud of to have been in, and the, and the movies that Jim has been in, have that feeling to them, because that's important. It's in, important to um, have the arts do that for society. And those are always the ones that we talk about. Iron Will, that's about the, the uh, dog sled race. Mm -hmm. It's an old film, but it's great for if your grandchildren or, your, or you want to watch that kind of a film. And some of the others have been good. North Country's a really North Country film. was really good. And that was my chance to play a villain, <laughs> which is always fun to play. What he really real. liked was Charlize Theron was played opposite him. That was. Uh, but, but some of the ones that weren't, that, where you didn't feel that. Oh, there was a Tim Allen movie that I did called Joe Somebody. It just had a bad feeling on the set through the entire shoot. And it was partially responsible because of, Tim Allen had a really sarcastic sense of humor. And, and the director seemed to kowtow to everything that Tim Allen wanted. And you couldn't get a straight answer out of the director for the scenes that you were in. And so half the actors were kind of walking around like, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's a mess. And it's like, yeah, it's one of those you can't wait for it to be over. I'll be happy to get paid for it, but don't show it. <laughs> yeah. So. Or this is my part. Is, I want to go to the rap party. I want to see you. And he's like, we're not going. I'm like, I want to go. Come on. He goes, no, I don't want to. I mean, he's, we're pretty, we aren't. He is. <laughs> but, you know, kind of ethical about, like, we're not going to participate in something that doesn't try to put a good product out there or something that where people had their feelings hurt or people were ugly to each other in there. We're just not gonna, we, you know, you just can't be doing that. And so there's been several things that we have not attended or we don't promote. Um, and, but, but the straight story is one where you feel, oh, I hope people will go see it. I hope that they'll uh, rent it again. I hope that mm -hmm. um, our children will see it. And you know, think about the goodness of what I loved about that film were all the little people that he meets along the way. You know, that first girl. Oh, and then the Ragbri. Wasn't it fun to see Ragbri in there? And um, and all. And then your whole group, those mm -hmm. those two boys, the the uh, brothers. Oh, yeah, the Farley brothers. They were <laughs> brothers of Chris Farley, who was on Saturday Night Live. They were hilarious. I mean, those scenes were 
it was tough to get the scenes done because they kept cracking us up. So. Yeah. But you were telling us that when you, do you, can he, t can we get a mic for him or is that not, can we not, not mic him? Oh, okay. He was telling us before, because we got a little chance to uh, meet him ahead of time, um, that, that he had um, invited Alvin and he spent the night, would you say five nights he was there, and that you said he had a few little quirks like that when your wife was making him supper and would take it out there that he didn't want to eat hot food, that he'd wait till it cooled off. So he wasn't the easiest, and then he wanted to sleep outside, and we got that in the movie, and that you had gone off to see something, you'd gone to Centerville, or I can't remember where. The horse, the horse oh, the Amish horse parade thing. And, um, oh, that's right, that's right. And when he got back, Al, he thought that the, or the um, lawnmower was going to be fixed by then, but it wasn't fixed. And so he went to the John Deere and said, how come you didn't fix it? And they said, well, we weren't sure if the guy was good for the money. And he said, yeah, he's good for it, or I'll pay for it, or whatever. And so they got it fixed, and then it rained one more day, and then he went on his way. But how wonderful that they offered their home. Yeah. You know, how wonderful. They don't know this man from Adam. But, you know, that's how... That's having, you know, trust. That's doing what's right for your fellow man. Um, and I don't, I don't know if we, do we do that still? I hope so. I hope so. Anyway, we thought we should probably also maybe share some things about being an actor, what it's like the, kind of the arc of our careers. Um, because it's, it's a kind of an unusual profession. Um, and we, because we were professional actors, that meant that we worked in uh, the theater. Well, the theater was where we met. We did, I did a lot of commercial work in a PBS show called Home Time and did some TV stuff and Jim always did film work and um, vo a lot of voiceovers. That's kind of how we made our bread and butter. But theater was our, Love and where we met 30, we've been married 36 years this year. So, um, so being professional actors mean that you are going to be doing eight shows a week. So you've got Monday nights off. You are, and a lot of these shows, the long ones run about a year at Chan Hassan Dinner Theaters. I don't know if y'all ever go up there, the old log theater. This is back in the heyday, and the Guthrie, and some smaller ones for the runs are. 10 to 16 weeks, mm -hmm. and it means you have to... And also, I, I toured quite a bit with the Guthrie, so those, those would be anywhere from eight months to a year going across the entire United States. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of fun, but by about month nine, <laughs> you're really sick yeah. of being in a bus. Yeah. <laughs> and you're really sick of checking into another hotel. Yeah. When you're and older, opening too. that suitcase one more time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I toured with the National Shakespeare Company. I had a bigger career when I was really young. So when you're 22 to 26 and you're touring around, you're not married, you're having fun in every city, you're doing these great Shakespeare plays, and, um, and someone else is making up the bed. <laughs> and someone else, you're just going out to dinner, and whoa, yeah. it was fun in the early That's 20s. Nice. When you have a family and you're going on tour, uh, it's a little different or going out, doing a gig, like a four month gig in Arizona or something like that. So that causes you to have to be um, very uh, disciplined. You have to, and even doing all the shows that we did, we were telling Sam and, the, um, and Ethan, in, or not? Ian? Ian. Ian, yes. Ian. Yes, sorry. See, I got it. Yes, Ian. <laughs> Ethan is another kid that, that was, that was in um, a show of ours. I was thinking about Noah. There's one of our previous students back there that was in the high school show with us right before the pandemic. Um, I forgot what I was saying. I don't know. Don't, don't look at me. I'm not going to be you. I don't know. We were talking about, what was I talking about? I guess it doesn't. Oh, touring. Yes, and that we would have to be really disciplined. So if um, we only have Monday nights off, we never ate out. Of course, we didn't have the money to eat. Well, people eat out a lot more. We never, our generation, we didn't eat out. 
um, once in a blue moon. Um, but we had dinner super early, and kids like that. You know, you eat at 5.30, 5, 5.30, and then we had to rest. And that meant rest our voices in between shows, or if we'd had rehearsal in the day, we had an evening show. The babysitter came around you know, 7, 7.15. We lived close to the theaters. We lived out in Excelsior, so that we were, Excelsior, Minnesota, so we were close to the long runs. That's Chanhassen and the Old Log Theater. The other ones you can drive, you can do a commute for a while, a few months, but not a year. Um, so that's why we lived there. And then our babysitter came. We had a wide variety of babysitters. And they would come at 7, and we'd get to the theater at 8, at 7.30s, half hour, and do our show from 8 to 10, 10.30, come home and, you know, get up and get the kids to school or whatever. It's a very disciplined, um, and you, your social life, uh, well, we go out often afterwards, because the babysitters on the weekend stay, but, you know, it's not like you go to dinner parties. Nobody's invited, because you're, you're the entertainment. <laughs> You're working Christmas, you know, you're doing all these. And the way that we were um, allowed to do this or how we were able to make a living and a nice little middle class upbringing for our children. It was, we were, we were in the middle class and it was because we were in the union. And the union, I know we wanted to talk a little bit about the impact of the union and the strike and all that. The union, um, we belong to Actors' Equity, which governs everything that's done on stage. We belong to AFTRA, which goes out over the, air, uh, the radio waves or that's shot on video. And SAG, Screen Actors Guild, is everything that's shot on film, whether it's a commercial or, or uh, a movie. So those two there, unions There was emerged. some overlap with SAG and AFTRA. AFTRA usually was east of the Mississippi. SAG was usually west of the Mississippi. But you could be doing a SAG job in the east. You could be doing an AFTRA yeah. job in the west. But then the two of them merged. Yeah. So, we, so when you're in the union, you're making a certain um, wage, like any other union. You know, you're making a certain wage. You can negotiate above that, but usually you're making whatever the minimum is. And there's certain work rules about how much you can do and when you get to take a break and all those things, which we really um, could relax knowing that we were going to be able to make a living. And it was, we weren't uncommon. I mean, this is in the 70s and 80s. Um, a lot of our, you know, plumber, you know, other people were union workers. We were like those folks, and we were able to raise a family of four on a regular basic, you know, salary. And then towards the, it was in the 90s that we started seeing a shift that all this voice work that Jim had been doing, movie stars started doing it. Like they got greedy. Doing this wasn't enough. They had to come and take. And, the, and if you lived in the, in the, mid, in the uh, middle part of the country, you did industrial films. That's all these training films for um, co companies would hire actors, to, and then they'd shoot this little film, and then they'd show it to their employees about how to sell a product or how you treat people or all those kinds of things. So we did all those. And those were all done by actors in Detroit and um, Kansas City and St. Louis and Minnesota, people who didn't want to live in New York or LA, who are just regular, they just want to raise a family and have a simple life, you know? Perfect example and, of that was uh, for about a year or two, I was doing all of the voiceover work for the St. Paul Pioneer Press newspaper, all the radio ads, all the TV ads. Then we moved out to Los Angeles. Because of his film career, we needed to like. Right, so we were living in Sherman Oaks and I would go into my agency out there like four times a week, which was an hour drive in and an hour drive back home. So all of a sudden I'm doing auditions for the St. Paul Pioneer Press. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah. Why don't you just hire me? Yeah, they'd gone out to LA to get a real actor. Yeah, and that would pay them a lot more. Yeah, that whole, we decided to go to California. I forgot about that. Well, let me just say just a little bit about these training films. Those, that was such great training for us as actors and for young stage actors. 
because you got used to being in front of the camera, you got used to the pressure of what it's like to be on a film, so that when a film came into town, we were, we were used to it. It's a, because it's a lot of time pressure, you have to be, it's like a hurry up and wait kind of job. And then when the camera starts rolling, you gotta be like on it. You can't have a lot of nerves. You have to be strong. And films had done that for us. Like um, American Express financial advisors that became American Express, they did training films. I was part of those in the 80s. It was the late 80s, early 90s. They uh, were doing sales techniques about how you sell insurance to same-sex couples. And nobody was talking about that. I mean, we just had AIDS, and we were just barely whispering about AIDS, and they were really cutting edge to talk about even personality style and how do you treat people and everything. And I always thought that that was a good way to train people, and they kind of have done away with that. I think, I'm not sure what they, how they train people now. They, but they didn't do that anymore. I can tell you, they, they took most of it to Canada. Oh, all that, that Vancouver and Toronto especially, so they, were, they do a lot of that kind of stuff that we used to do regularly. Yeah, but I always felt good about that work. Again, thinking about, you know, the common good or what you're, you're tr the, the companies were really trying to um, teach people how to treat other folks and train people well. And I don't know if that's, I don't even know, maybe they do something online now. But that's where um, the business, the future kind of went towards all this online stuff. So our unions have had to figure out what does artificial intelligence, how, what's the future of that? What's the future of streaming services and how you use someone's likeness I don't think anybody's voice. figured out artificial intelligence no. yet properly. Yeah. And as a teacher, Either I mean, some of you are probably... Users. Some of you are probably college professors, so we just, I teach at St. Mary's, and one of the classes I teach is professional communication, basically public speaking. And, um, and they have to, and we had to make a statement. The dean asked me, um, are you gonna allow your students to use artificial intelligence to write their speeches? I'm like, a hard no. <laughs> no, I think, but maybe researching topics, like coming up with out of the box topics, but uh, no, I'm very worried about their minds. <laughs> You know? But we had to put a statement in our syllabus about that it's, you know, you can't do that. And, but that's weird. But anyway, the, this last strike that we had was one side of it had to do with how we're going to handle the future. Mm -hmm. And then one side was the suits wanting to make money off the talent. So the writer's strike and the actor's strike was all about Of course, we're biased, but the greed. I mean, our son's a writer now, and he's working with in the, that realm, and he goes, oh, because he sees the contract, his attorney will show us the contract and said, the, the actors and the writers make their way down here, and these people who are, you know, all this, those, the decision makers, they're way, 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 way up there. And I was like, wow, I just didn't think that people would be like that. But that was what the strike was about. That's not you know. that unusual. I, 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 I've had a fight for pay on projects. Oh. Tell, them about the Dis tell them about Disney. Especially Disney. <laughs> Everybody loves Disney. But Jim always said, it's fun to make that. It's fun to make that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that little uh, mouse act squeal. Actors, actors refer to working for Disney as if, yeah, I'm going to Mauschwitz. <laughs> okay, we better be careful what we say. This will be out there. You know, you kind of worry. Well, that's what worry, actors like, said, so. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, their, Tell product, about their products are generally very good, but to get there is such a chore sometimes. They no, cheat. it's it's just, they I was cheat. doing, uh, it was Iron Will. I, yeah. Um, I had a friend of mine named Michael Laskin from, from Minneapolis. We had worked on projects together. He had just recently moved to Los Angeles. Well, so he auditioned for Iron Will out there. I auditioned for Iron Will in Minneapolis. Okay. We were both in the exact same scenes. And we had basically the same number of lines. And all of our, a lot of our scenes were with Kevin Spacey. The three of us were supposed to be news reporters from Chicago following this dog sled race. 
So we were basically in the same scenes. Well, Mike and I went out and had lunch or whatever it was, and we started comparing paychecks. And it was like they were paying him 350 bucks a week more than they were me. So I had to go in and have a talk with them. <laughs> <laughs> and they had, they had two producers, one of them that was in charge of the production itself, the other guy was the money guy. So this guy who was like invis Mr. Invisible, he, he, he never said hello to anybody. Uh, he, was, he was just sort of this ghost walking around all the time. Snake in the grass. So, so I'm talking to like one of the accountants and all of a sudden I feel a hand on my shoulder and it's this guy going, Jim, how you doing? <laughs> it's like, I'll tell you how I'm doing. <laughs> So we got it straightened out, but I mean, it's just an example of there are reasons that people strike. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You and just can't nobody get away wants with to. It. Hmm? I mean, you, it's not like you want to. No, it's, just, it's no fun striking. No. It's terrible. Uh, yeah. And it's a very, very last resort. But I always feel like we're, that those of us who are a little bit more, um, articulate or more comfortable speaking out a little bit, that we owe it to the folks who we're speaking on behalf of, who giving, giving voice to someone who maybe wouldn't have that or wouldn't know to do that. And it's the right, it's just the right thing to do. I do think that being an, in, the, um, in the arts, that you, maybe because you only go into it because you're so drawn to it, that you are almost naive, well, that you just, just assume everybody just a, has the common good. There's a big learning curve, so that's, that's one thing that, that you guys that are thinking about doing it, fight for it. Yeah. If you're any good at it, fight for it, and don't take any nonsense because you're putting out the value, yeah. okay? It's not the suits that are in the offices making deals. Yeah. I mean, that's we need those people too, but not as many of them. There's a whole bunch of those people, and only a few over here. And you know, you know like that's not that's improper yeah, I mean, balance of things. But, I mean, I got I, I had a silly little experience. I was doing a a, a, a TV pilot for ABC oh. when we were out in Los Angeles. So it had a you know interesting set. It, it never got picked up, but it was it was a nice show. Or the idea of it. So they had a, right off the set, they had a live audience, so the comic came in, warmed up everybody, and then we got to shooting the, the thing. There was a great big table with all sorts of, you know, glasses of, of, of water, fruit bowls, all sorts of crackers and candy Craft and service, whatnot. service, they call it. So when you weren't on the scene, you sat down at this table and, you know, had a drink or whatever. So I'm sitting there while this scene is work, working and Two of the, or two or three of the suits showed up, and they're standing here, and they're trying to shoot the scene, and these guys are talking about, they're comparing where they got their ties from. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I hear the director go, who's talking over there? Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> yeah. it's great that they're doing, you know, the business end of it, but come on. Yeah. You, you have no idea what it takes to put a show together. Yeah. I don't know what it takes to do your job. If you want to teach me that, that's fine. But otherwise, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to talk, when we moved to California so that he could, because um, he had a great agent and we were, in, we were older, you were like in your early 40s or something. That and was so, part of the reason that it didn't quite work, yeah. going, to, going to Los Angeles when you're 46. Yeah. So we you went to, to LA. Earlier. And we enrolled our we enrolled our son in a great Lutheran school, the Laurel Hall, where all the kids go, or all the fancy Hollywood kids go. I mean, the ones where we, that we could afford. I mean, we did not go to the fancy school. We went to this great little Lutheran school. I remember how wonderful it was. And our daughter was in the preschool there. And Jim, I was working for the Malibu Conference Center doing like big um, events, things like that, because I was kind of out of it. By that time, I was 38 years old, and you're too old. Um, so he's getting these jobs, 
And you know, our parents are saying, you know, how's it going out there? I go, well, it's going pretty well. Nah, nah, nah. And then he's up for something that's really big. He shoots it, and it's like a pilot that's going to go. And he says to me, I don't want this thing to work. We got to like, we had a church and everything. We're like, seriously praying that this doesn't go. And I think like, why are we here? We're enrolling our kids in a private school where the money's kind of draining. We weren't, we weren't completely out yet, but it was dripping. It was draining, you know, down. And uh, I said, you know, I have no problem going back with my tail between my legs back to the Midwest. I don't care. I have no pride. And so we just decided that for our family, the way, and nothing wrong, we have good friends that live out in LA. And um, they were able to do that. But for us, and the way that we were raised, the way that we wanted our children to be brought up, and what we wanted our day-to-day -day life to be like was not that. And so we came back, and Don Stoltz, immediate, at the old log, loved us, immediately put us into a show, and our, we just got back into life the way, and we just kind of settled back down. And that was a um, quick little trip that it was very expensive because we sold our house and we had to buy a new house when we moved back and all that. However, it's good to do those kind of things, to shake, shake yourself up. And it was okay that we were in our earlier, he was in his 40s. So what? Um, you know, yeah, I'm really glad that. we did it. It was, it was, we learned a lot. A yeah. lot of it was fun. It was great to be in nice weather in February. And, and it was okay to say that we don't want that. But well, we had we had two little kids, mm -hmm. and there were too many episodes that were oh, just yeah. weird. Like I got called back like four times for some sort of a, a project, and I show up. I think I had to drive down to Orange County, which was took forever to get down there, and it was like a thirty uh, thirty floor building. We had to go up to the top floor because the guy that owned the building had the entire floor to himself for the final callback because he was the money for this project. So I walk in and I'm looking over the, the script that I'm going to do and all of a sudden Richard Roundtree walks in. He played Shaft, big black guy. So it's myself and Richard, and Richard Roundtree up for this part. Like they're not so quite we're both sure. looking at each other like, Really? <laughs> Apparently they're not sure what they want. <laughs> and then we found out they gave the parts to an English woman. <laughs> so, <laughs> so how are you going to how are you gonna base a career out there yeah. on stuff like that? Yeah. There was another one where I was <laughs> I was shooting something, I showed up, uh, they told me where to where to park my car, I walked over to and, and I had an entire trailer to myself. There was like oh, an yeah. enormous flower bouquet with wine and fruit and candy inside. And there was like a great big card. Welcome, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to working with you on this project. So we shot the whole thing. At the end of the night, I walk out there to get my clothes. Everything was locked. <laughs> like there was like, nothing. You're I done. In. I had to go find a security guard to let me in to get my clothes. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, you know, so this different. isn't really the kind of stuff that I'm used to yeah. in the Midwest. Yeah. So we so. moved back, and so that was like in our 40s. We moved back, and um, we really got back into theater, started getting back into doing stuff, and really realizing that as you approach in this career or every career, that you're going, that the parts start to be fewer and fewer. There were not as many films, no films were coming to the Twin Cities, they were always going to Canada, but also that you start to get this feeling in your 50s that it's, that you, at least for us, a social obligation to give back. And so started doing some different things. Like I actually changed careers in my 40s and went back to school and got a degree in arts and cultural management. Started thinking about what are other things that I can use my acting background as a differentiator and branch into like working with executives on their, and mainly I work with physicians, surgeons, and attorneys on their interpersonal communication skills, 
which can be very helpful to them. When you know, or accountants, if you, you might know your job really well, but working with that other person, you don't intend to come off the way you come off. So how do you bridge that? So you know, I could help folks with that. And then you got involved, well, I think, I in Well, I started teaching at the Guthrie uh, in the community ed department. So people from the community were coming in to learn about, you know, how to read a script and all, all that kind of stuff. So, and then I joined Rotary. Which is a wonderful organization. So we got involved in, you know, giving scholarships to high school kids and uh, doing book drives and all sorts yeah. of other stuff. You started being the head usher at our church. We go to a large UCC church in, um, in uh, Minnesota and Jim was like scheduling what he called the God Show. <laughs> <laughs> you know, getting all the ushers and, you know, getting that all going. Because that was something he could offer because it was kind of like directing. And um, uh, then we, st we started working at Minnetonka High School, co-directing up there. So we've been there 20 years. And in fact, one of our students is right here. I remembered that Noah was in Witness for the Prosecution right before the pandemic. Yep, that was our last show. Well, it was... February of 2020, when he starred in that, and I remember him telling us that he was going to go to Luther College. So, yes, and here he is. Yes, mm -hmm. but working with the high school students over a period of 20 years, and both of us teaching, but also my um, teaching in a university setting since 2005, you kind of start to see what's going on in terms of education, but in terms of students and our culture over those 20 years. So when we first started in like 2005, remember how the kids would, oh, yeah. you're just constantly talking, talk, 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 and you would have to say, quiet down back there, because we'd be directing up here and they would be, you know, it's hard to get them. And then we noticed it started in about five years, in about what, 2010, 2011, somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, suddenly everybody had uh, cell phones, so you would be directing, and as soon as we were done directing a scene, they'd split and immediately were on the cell phone. It was phone so quiet. Like, Don't you because want to write down Because they're all doing this. Some of these notes, maybe. <laughs> they're all doing this, and we realized like the quiet was not a good thing, and so then. At some point, because by the time that you were in high school, they had you put your cell phone in a thing. So then they built a device where the kids had a number, their phone was attached to a number, and they had, when they came into the space, they had to put their cell phone there, and all the parents were aware, stop texting your kid all through rehearsal. They can live an hour without your input. <laughs> that was the other thing, these parents, yikes. <laughs> Like, they gotta be all involved. Like, we send our kids to school and say, see you later, <laughs> you know? <laughs> see, but these parents are like, whoa. Um, but our students also um, really, it's like they needed us to help them feel good, or I don't know how to describe it, but I know that there's a big difference between 2005 and 2024. We used to plan rehearsals around orthodontic, getting their teeth tightened, or whatever, you know what I mean. And you know what we plan around now? Therapy. They'll say, we, I have therapy. I'm like, you know, because I don't know, I don't, you know, whatever, but um, it's very noticeable. And it's not just the pandemic, it was starting before that. And it just worries me that they feel the need to have um, we're trying to emphasize that it's about the process. Of course we have to have a product that an audience wants to come and see the story. It has to be well done. But we want our students to experience what is it like to do this and how you interact with others. And um, it, I mean, I don't want to put you on the spot, Noah, but wouldn't you say that's what we... He and I weren't always on the best of terms. Uh, there was a lot of uh, 
very typecasting, very typecast uh, selection was being made, and um, it just wasn't a super healthy and sustainable environment the whole time. I think uh, you know, a game changer with working with you guys is you know, the time spent on, like you said, um, you know, the process of how do we create a show that yes, audiences want to see, but how do we grow as people and actors in between that as well? Well, gosh, I didn't know you were going to say that, but thank you. <laughs> that was lovely. Yeah, we do try to teach um, because, you know, honestly, we might have 20 kids in a show and we've been doing it for 20 years. Out of that group, you know, maybe 10 kids out of the hundreds are going to become professional actors. But they're all going to have jobs. They're all going to have bosses. They're all going to be, or some of them will become bosses or managers. Some of them will be married and be parents. And there's so many leadership lessons that you learn in working in a collaborative environment like the theater that you can carry over into other things, which is why I say it's so important that our students and all of us still um, continue to give ourselves opportunities to be involved in an activity that isn't um, that that helps us free up our mind. I mean, there's so much new research on. What's that book, The Brain on Art, about our, how our mm -hmm. um, brain works and how we need that creative outlet? And so we just think about that or um, how you... And it's not just theater. It's music. It's all the arts. Mm -hmm. I mean, we just heard recently on the news up in Minneapolis, there's budget cuts happening in the educational system. And one high school is first, first cut music. Why music? Oh. I mean, I, I can appreciate doing calculus, but yeah. how many guys are going to be scientists? <laughs> I don't think you have to be a calculus piece. I even hate that they, that they um, cut cursive writing. Every show, and no one knows this, I write a handwritten note to every student that was involved in our show. Backstage, it's a lot of handwriting. It's a lot of notes. And a lot of kids over four years, so I keep notes like, what did I say to that child last year? So I remember that I don't, it's, it's not by road. I really think about it because they, they need that. And that's my gift to give them, is something truthful and honest. And so somebody this year who's got, who was a senior said, oh, I can't wait to read this when I get home. And I said, well, you could just read it right now. And she goes, oh, my mom will read it to me. I said, Claire, what? She goes, oh, I don't, I'm not very good at reading your cursive. You have beautiful handwriting. I can tell it's beautiful, but my mom reads them to me. Oh. I'm like, oh, Claire. Oh, no, Claire. I used to love because it, it's kind of artistic, you know, to write like that. Anyway, <laughs> we should probably, you wanted to um, talk about, the, read something from the script. We should close. I realize that we've kind of overdone well, our time, but... We were thinking about, no, he had this, um, about the movie and what it made you, that when you're in a theater, we're having kind yeah, of a. This, this is a, a little speech that Alvin had that I just really like. When he said, when my kids were young, I played a game with them. I'd give each of, each of them a stick, one for each of them, and I'd tell them to break it. They do that easy. Then I tell them to make one bundle of all the sticks and try to break that. Of course, they couldn't. I used to say that was family. That's bundle. Yeah. Yeah. So when we come into the theater, we are as one. We are having some kind, we're kind of doing that social trust thing where we are all here for a common reason we don't really know each other but we are having that experience together and that's what I think these these kinds of things can do for uh, the common good mm -hmm. so, do you want to take a couple questions sure, sure. anybody have a question <laughs> have, about anything we kind of talked a lot got any sports questions <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Someone asked us earlier about how we got started in our, in our career, the impact. I think that's kind of an interesting 
story about you coming from Chicago to Cedar Rapids when you were... Yeah, m my, my parents escaped from Czechoslovakia in 1948. And my sister, uh, they escaped to West Germany and then uh, they went to Sweden. And my sister and I were born in Sweden. When I was f just about five years old, we came to the United States. And I grew up in Chicago on the south side. <laughs> there you go, <laughs> south side. Uh -huh. But he didn't speak English. No, I didn't speak English until I was like in second, first or second grade. Kindergarten was a complete wash. I had no idea what was going on. Uh, they, didn't ha they didn't have English as a second language like they did do now. You well, just... you know, I knew how to throw the beanbag into the clown. <laughs> but other than that, uh, and then my, my dad, I, I had started high school in Chicago, and I was mainly doing sports. I was playing baseball and playing football. And my dad got a job in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. He was selling insurance for a, for a particular company. Their headquarters was in Cedar Rapids. This spoke so Czech. My, my first reaction was, where the hell am I? Because <laughs> it's like the first car ride was like, there's nothing here. It's just corn. Uh, so I started playing football. I got injured. I had a friend of mine in high school here, because I got here for my junior year. And uh, he had done some theater in high school at, at Jefferson in Cedar Rapids. And they were doing Guys and Dolls, and they needed another follow spot operator. So I said, yeah, OK. Since I Big guy. Play, I can't play football right now, so sure. So we went up into the, the loft and had, and I kept thinking as we were doing the shows, like, these people aren't that good. <laughs> and then I got talked into auditioning for a show, and I got cast. And it was a big part. And I was like, how do I do this? <laughs> and that, that just pretty much started it. I was better at doing theater than I was playing right guard on the football team. <laughs> Talk about the teacher, the director. Yeah, I, I was really influenced by both my high school uh, drama coach and, and then I went to UNI and they had a great theater department. Uh, Bob Guider was, was my teacher in, in high school. He was a great, great, nice man. Mm -hmm. uh, at UNI, it was uh, Dr. Stan Wood, George Glenn, Jay Adelant, and D. Terry Williams. Wonderful theater department. I had great roles. I had a wonderful time in college. And it was theater. And, and it set me off on a career. I got a job within days of leaving college. And I worked constantly for, for over 40 years, so. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. Th that's not uncommon to have a teacher that impacts you in the high school or college thing. The other really common thing that actors will tell is, is my story, which is having something um, happen really when you're young and then you just hold on to it. So I was a young, um, I'm from Mississippi. So we moved up to Iowa. I was in second grade. And you know, Jim and I have been married for a long time before we realized that we had kind of that displaced thing, because it was 1963, I was coming from Mississippi, I'd been in the first integrated schools, and um, so I come up here, and um, my parents got a call from this music, or this person, uh, Parsons College, I don't know if you remember, know that little school. Okay, so back in the late 60s, it was a big deal school in that they would get these fat guest artists to come and be in the shows, and then they would job in local talent. So I can't even remember who the big stars were, but they called my mother and said, we'd like her to audition for uh, one of the kids for Sound of Music. So I went in, and I was scared to death. And I was kind of small for my age, so I was seven. And, um, and I remember telling my mother, I was sitting beside her, and I said, I don't feel very good. I remember her saying, that's just butterflies in your stomach, honey. You just get up there and sing. And I thought, How'd they get in there? <laughs> but I got up there and sang, and I got the part. So I'm Gretel, the youngest Von Trapp child. So the, I remember we're up there on the stage. It was a big stage, and the director was in the dark. You can't see them. If the lights are down, they're out there, but they got a big voice. And we have to sta step forward. You know, every child steps forward. You know that show. They blow the whistle, you step forward, and I'm the last one. So I step forward, and I say, Gretel! 
<laughs> and he goes, I hear him say, could you do that again? Miss Egley, could you do that again, please? And I'm like, I, I must not have been loud enough. So, Griddle! <laughs> you know, because I have a southern accent. Griddle! It's like, I couldn't hear the difference between I and E, you know, Wendy and Windy. I couldn't hear that, or Pen and Pin. Everything was, you know, I talked like a southerner. And I remember feeling like, ooh, and he said, someone work with her or something. But I could do the little, that son has gone to bed and so must I, little song she sings. And I, had, I didn't have a problem with that. So the show, we're going to open. And two days before we open, I got up in the morning, and I didn't feel good. My dad was a doctor. I go into the bedroom, and I say, I don't feel good. I remember my dad going like, and he said, uh, she has the mumps. She'll be home for two weeks. Oh, and the other girls are going to get it. I came from a family of four girls. The, I was the oldest. The other girls will get it, too. And you better call Mrs. Ruby. Mrs. Ruby was the music director from the show. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you can't do the show. You're quarantined. That was, you know, this is how long ago it was. And I started to cry. That was it. My dad went for rounds at like 7.45 in the morning. I came, he came home for lunch every day. I was laying on the sofa in the family room crying. He came home from evening at 5.30 for dinner. I was still crying. He says, you I'll never forget. He goes, you are still crying about this? And I said, you don't understand. I'm going to be an actress. <laughs> and that's what I based my career on. Uh -huh. Isn't that terrible? I was seven. And just I just like went like this. I'd never considered anything else. And I just went that whole way. And so you will hear actors talk about Jim's kind of story, this thing that happened in high, or mine, holding on to some pipe dream. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. How did you get started in voice acting? Um, oh, I know. Uh, I, Dudley Riggs or something? Yeah, when I first moved to Minneapolis, um, I got a job right away at uh, an improv comedy group. And one of the things that we did was we also had a side show with uh, NPR, like once a week. So we would record this stuff at a recording studio. They were just little, little comic sketches. That's, that's how I got started with it. Uh, then I got, uh, I was hired to do the voice of Darth Vader. <laughs> George Lucas had, uh, he, he wanted to do a radio series. And so I, I did the voice of Darth Vader. So that's it, and, and then I put a, a tape together, demo tape, I got an agent, and they started sending me out on voiceover auditions, so I started doing voiceover. And he's got a gorgeous voice, and you're nice. If you are, And, the, and that really like helped, like that was, that was one of the things that I got to do in Los Angeles. I was, I was doing <coughs> uh, voiceover for cartoons for Nickelodeon. That was nice, nice income, plus it was fun to do. Uh, then I got, I was the voice of Pizza Hut for a year. <laughs> that was boring, but it paid a lot of bills, so. Yeah. But yeah. You, you put, put a tape together, yeah. or demo something, a demo yeah. reel of some sort, mm -hmm. and get a really good agent. That's, yeah. you, can't, you can't do anything professionally without an agent. It's yeah. just impossible. You don't necessarily need a manager. That you don't need until you're way yeah, far into your career, but I mean, you need you, an agent. If you, if you make a career out of it, you're going to have to get a publicity person. You're going to have to get a manager. You've got a staff that you have to pay. Mm -hmm. Did you have a question? Uh, when did the voice come? Was that in high school or something that developed over the years? I'm sorry. Your, vo your voice. You've always had a deep voice, right? Or did you develop it more? That you have. When did that well, show up? I grew up in Chicago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. So you I think that in high school already and college, it was part of your college. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I had the voice I had. I, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know yeah. if it was any good or not. It was people told me that it was good. So. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 do, I do remember when Jim, one time, because um, he hasn't been a singer typically, or, you know, um, his voice was just a speaking voice, did a lot of voiceovers. And one time I was playing the piano at home and 
It was right when Les Mis came out, and I wanted, you know, that song, bring him home, bring him home, bum, 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 bum. That is a very wide range for a man to sing. And I just was curious about, because Jim has this lower range, let's just, and so I had him, I just run the scales. I mean, I knew at church he would sing, but because he was brought up Catholic, they don't sing the same hymns that I had been brought up, so he wasn't as, you know, but I could tell, he, he's got a nice voice. And I had him run those scales, and I was like, oh my word, if you'd been my child, you'd be on Broadway. You would have had lessons, you know. Well, I mean, you know, gr growing up in Chicago, the schools that I went to, the elementary schools, we didn't have a mu music program of any kind. No. It, 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 I, I know that we sang as a group, depending on which class it was, because the teacher wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. But there was no structure to teach music of any kind. But once he got that, I, I said, you can really sing. You can be over at Chanhassen and do these musicals. So he, we got him a voice teacher to make him more confident. And he can't read music. So, and I tried to teach him to read music, but when you're at, you know, in your 40s, it's really hard to learn. It's like learning another language. So he, but he put the work in, and we had Jan Puffer, a friend of ours who's a choreographer, come and help him learn what the typical dance moves are going to be, because when you do a dance audition, that you do five, six, seven, eight, you have to learn a routine. It's on an eight count, and you have to be able to do that. So she practiced with him, and then he went over to Chan, and, you know, they know him because he's done the straight shows there. They know us. And he said, and he auditioned for Music Man, and they cast him as Mayor Shin. And he was fabulous. He didn't have a solo. He didn't need to have a solo, but he was, you know, could support and be that great um, character. And then he, you did uh, music, or you did Sound of Music, and you did Fiddler on the yeah, Roof. And then and I, did, did, I was so proud music, of him. I did the musical version of Scrooge, and I played Scrooge. And he so had I a had solo? A couple, of, a couple of solos, and that was like. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but it was such a good thing to stretch yourself. And, you know, you can't get to second with your foot still on first. You got to kind of take that. You got to, I'm going to try it and think that you might fail. But that was really challenging. Oh, there's somebody. Oh. Yeah, um, this might seem silly, but since you mentioned you did voice acting for cartoons, did you? I mean, this is, I've always wondered, and now this is a big thing. What comes from, how do you voice act a cartoon? Do you, do you look at the, the cartoon character and try to catch and the speed of that, it, or do they adjust to your reading? How does that No, it, it, it really varies as far as how far in development they are with a particular cartoon. Yeah. I, I, I didn't do any regular characters on any of these shows for Nickelodeon. I played, you know, guest characters. Like for there was a show called Real Monsters, and my gut, my it was a show about insects, okay, <laughs> you know spiders and all of that stuff, and this is the one that I I can just think of off the top of my head was uh, I had to do whatever insect I was I think I was a cockroach or something like that, <laughs> and I had to do Jerry Lewis voice. <laughs> So, you know, it was like this, and hey, nice lady, la, 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 <laughs> that kind of stuff. So, I mean, they had a, a fairly decent picture of what they wanted. So they said, okay, make something up with Jerry Lewis. Yeah. So you're not and dubbing. You the cartoon after you've, I'm trying to figure out how they do the visual with the voice. What comes first? Again, it, it depends, because sometimes they don't, they don't really have anything to show you. They just, they just say, this is what we're looking for. I, I did the, the three R's, Rugrats, Real Monsters, Ren and Stimpy, <laughs> okay? So I, I, different, different shows had different people doing the artwork and different directors and all that stuff. Some of them were really prepared. Some of them practically had, you know, pre uh, they had already recorded a bunch of stuff so I could hear the other voices, the other characters over headphones. So that, so that was easy, and some of them, all they had was like a partial sketch of what they were thinking of for this particular character. So it's, you just have to figure out, I mean, every, every job is so different, you just gotta be prepared to sort of, it's loosey-goosey, figure it out. Yeah, so it's not like dubbing, when you're dubbing over your own, like fixing 
vocal things. Did you have to do any of that for Straight Story? Yeah, I had to do yep. a lot of that. There's also another, another way to earn a living out in Los Angeles is what's called a walla group. And a walla means it's a wall of sound. Whenever you see any kind of a restaurant scene, whether it's TV or film, all of the background people that are seated at a table at a restaurant, they don't say a word. They're all miming, okay? Then the Walla group comes in and fills, it, fills in after they've shot the scene. So you, you're, you're watching the scene and you've got 15 other people just talking to each other and you know, blah, 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 blah. Now, one of the, re one of the reasons, uh, since I speak Czech, because that's my background, they were doing a, uh, I think it was Willa Cather, I can't oh, remember. Oh yeah, probably, My Antonio? Yeah, My Antonio, Anto that's right. And so they had to have a bunch of Czech voices, so I was in a Walla group with a bunch of Czech speakers. So there were about 10 of us that spoke Czech, and all we did was just babble in Czech. <laughs> Just talk to each other. <laughs> He's making me think of the very first film he did was shot in Iowa, and he was an extra. So for all you folks that were extras oh, in the Straight geez. Story, so he yeah. was in Fist. I don't know. That was Stice. St 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 what's his it name? Was shot in Dubuque and East Dubuque. Tell him about you being the extra. Yeah, I had just gotten a job in Minneapolis with uh, <laughs> the comedy improv group. Right, and I'd, I'd been at it for almost a year, something like that, and then I heard about Fist, and they were looking for extras, because it was, it was about the, uh, it was Sylvester Stallone's first movie after Rocky. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> the whole thing was about union organizers in the 30s. So they, they wanted a lot of extras. They wanted extras to play the workers, and then they wanted a whole bunch of actors to play the goons and the cops, crooked cops and all that, and they had, Huge fights. I mean, there were like over a hundred extra, something like that. Well, so I went down there to audition with another guy that was in the company, and we decided after a couple of days on the set, is like, now when we go to the theater, we're not going to be able to see ourselves unless we can figure out some sort of a character. So we, we decided to. He decided he was going to be man with a toothpick, and I was man chewing gum. <laughs> Okay, so we'd spent like two or three days doing that. You know, I was really chewing, so I I, I sort of get behind Sylvester. So he's in the background. So he's standing there, going, nah, 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 nah. and so finally one day we we've got like fifty of the extras lined up, and there's a scene going on over here, and he's busy with the toothpick, and I'm busy with the gum, and all of a sudden I hear Norman Jewison very famous, well-known director who'd been up for three Emmys or three the Academy Oscars. Awards. Okay, this, oh, yeah. this guy did Fiddler on the Roof, he did Moonstruck, he did a whole mess of really good movies. So I'm busy he's chewing 22. gum and all of a sudden he takes out his bullhorn and he's way off in the distance and I hear, man chewing gum, don't! <laughs> So that was my introduction to film work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but making him say that Oscars made me think about Straight Story. So Straight Story, this wonderful actor, um, Richard Farnsworth, was up for an Academy Award. So Jim's out on tour. This movie, because the movie comes out like a year afterwards, you know, it's way delayed, and who cares about it then, except for it was up for his Academy Awards. So my, the children and I, Nicholas and Olivia, and I were watching the Academy Awards, and all of a sudden they show the scene that Richard Farnsworth is up, for, you know, because he's up, he's nominated for Best Actor, and the scene they picked was the one between you, between Danny and um, and this and Alvin, and I was like, oh, and they're like, there's Danny, Danny. I call Nick. This is or call Jim. This is when we have the old rotary phones, you know. I call him, and he's. Picks up. He's in. He's in L.A. You know, or something. And no, I was. I was on tour with the Guthrie. Oh, the Guthrie. And I was okay. In some hotel. Yeah. So I said, "Are you watching the Academy Awards?" He goes, "No, I hate that stuff. I'm watching baseball." I said, "Jim, you're on the Academy Awards." And he's trying to find the station. By that time, it was over. But it was so. It was so typical of Jim to not care about being on the Academy Awards, but that baseball. That happened so that to me has twice. Been I've been on the Oscar show twice. <laughs> it was that time, yes. and for North Country, they picked a scene that I was in with Charlize Theron. Yeah. Missed that one, too. <laughs> yes. Yes. But it, it does show you that, that um, you, I think to really be a true artist, you really can't be in it for all those reasons. 
You need to be in it because you want to tell a story that, or express something, I, like these visual artists that we met tonight, that um, impact the audience to feel something or to, um, you know, have, have, be a, have a connection. And that's why we've had the career that we've had. If you're going to get into this line of work, I would recommend going in with the mindset that you want to be a working actor. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a star, that's a completely different ballgame. That means you live and breathe. You, have, you don't have time for anything else. And you don't have I to wanted talented. a lot of time for other things. Yeah. Because, you, because we're just basically workers Yeah. as, yeah. A, as an artist. Yeah. And it's the same, same thing for dancers. It's the same thing for musicians. Yeah. You just want to do the stuff. And you want to do it as well as you could possibly do it. And have the audience enjoy it. I know we're going way over. He probably wants us to. We okay? Yeah. Oh, we are? Would I feel you, like. Would you like, maybe we can do oh. one more question. And sure. Then we're wrap. Oh. How long were you on the set? I'm, I'm sorry. How I, long were you on the set? This one? For a straight story. It's hard to say because, as I recall, uh, you know, Richard Farnsworth was not in great shape. Yeah, he didn't live too long afterwards, did he? No. Uh, he, he passed away in 2000. He committed suicide yeah. because he had terminal cancer. Yeah. But uh, he was, he, I mean, he told us that he, had hip, that he was going to have hip surgery and stuff, but it was already cancer. Mm -hmm. So... Um, but typically shoots are around six to eight weeks, sometimes longer. Yeah, six longer. to eight weeks, but I remember I, I came and I shot a bunch of stuff and then I had a, we were supposed to shoot another day, but he had, he needed like another day or two off. And I don't know if they took him to a hospital or, or what the deal was, but so I went back up to Minneapolis and then I came down again. So I think a total of probably eight days of shooting, actual shooting. But it was probably 11 days total with kind of spread out. So yeah. like I said, all I shot was that section of the thing. I did not shoot anything before that. I didn't see any of that until I actually went to the movie theater and saw it. Mm -hmm. Were you happy with the result? Yeah, I was. But like she said early, the pace of it was so slow. <laughs> I was sitting there going like, when's this thing going to pick up? Let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> but, it, but then it after about 10 minutes, I was like, Boy, this is really Relaxing. a nice pace to tell this story. Oh, it was. So I loved being in this movie. Yeah, yeah. There was another question at the back, yes? Yeah, so you mentioned something about being underpaid for Disney. Uh, why do you feel like you're underpaid, and how did you fight to get paid what you actually deserve? Well, he, he just found out that they were paying um, a local, he was considered local talent. From Minnesota, and even though his friend had been cast in LA, he was considered out of town talent. So that right there is why they think they can get away with it. But so you go in and you say, I'm, you know, I don't want to, or the agent, I think you did it for yourself. The agent should have caught that. Yeah, the agent I, should have said, there's a term called um, where everybody gets paid. Favored nations. Favored nations, where. I would put that in my contract. Like, I'm not having someone else um, who's got a, a smaller part than me. I'm carrying this thing on my back or whatever. I need favored nations, meaning if someone else ne negotiates above, then I get the bump as well. So it's, it is a way to help people have pay equity on there. But with um, Disney, you just really need to um, look at the fine print. But that's the, that's <laughs> the reason that I, that I went in to straighten it out is because I did have favored nations in my contract, mm -hmm. and they were still trying to, to slide by. Yeah. Just assuming that I so. wouldn't create any kind of hassle up for them. Yeah. You know, people don't like to talk about money very much, and they don't like to compare it, but I think it's, um, and sometimes you should be paid more because you are doing more, or there's more time, or your experience. Like, I expect to make more on something than we're doing a show this um uh oh no i had to go to his thing but uh jim and i are going to be doing on golden pond as guest equity actors for our local for minnetonka community theater and 
you know, at first we thought, are we old enough? And we realized, like, yeah, we are. <laughs> because the character in the play, I'm six, I just had my 68th birthday last week, and the character's 69, and the director said, Suzanne, I think we can fudge it a year. I'm like, okay. And he's supposed to be 79, he's going to be turning 76, so yes, we are old enough for the play. But when they are jobbing in the uh, young actress who's going to be playing our daughter, who's 42 and has not had the experience that we have had and everything, um, she will not be making the salary that I will make. And that's, we, at this stage in our career, we deserve that, we're worth it. And if, when, he, when we do a shoot, I do, we do something in two or three takes. And someone who hasn't had the same experience will take 20 takes. And you pay for that, you know? So we're cheaper, or you pay us more for the experience and expertise and all that. A lot, just like of, any a lot other of this profession. stuff is just experience. The more stuff you do, the more stuff you learn. When mm -hmm. we moved out to Los Angeles and I got an agent, they start at double scale. So whatever I was getting in Minneapolis, let's say I, was, like, I got 500 for a job, I'd get 1,000. In, in Los Angeles. But you know, That's our rent, the way it the, we had to have our child in private school, you know, the cost of living, that just kind of evens it all out. But, we had to do private uh, school because the public schools, who believe. I mean, we're big pro public school people, believe me. We're <clears throat> pro public school. And we also wanted our child to stay alive. <laughs> he didn't have to be educated, but he needed to stay to alive. So and I finally got off my high horse and said, well, there's this nice little Lutheran school that everybody talks about. So we went to them, and I just loved that little school. That was a great school. So. OK. <laughs> we talked way. Oh. Nice note of a Lutheran school. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Thanks to Mr. Rear and his family for coming yes. out here. And oh. thanks to Suzanne and Thank you. Thank you. I feel like we should have had you talk more. <laughs> <laughs>